Welcome and thank you uh, for joining us for International NASH Day and our panel on NASH and liver cancer. My name is Donna Cryer and I will be your moderator today. We are one of six thought leader webinars that are being conducted as part of International NASH Day, which is an initiative of the Global Liver Institute that we are conducting with 80 different partners this year in 25 countries. We are so grateful for this collaboration. International NASH Day is being celebrated this year as a virtual multi-platform experience to raise awareness of NAFL, which is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. You'll learn more about that over the course of our conversation. Um, but not only to raise awareness, to spark a global movement uh, of actions to improve the lives of people at risk for and living with these conditions. Um, please visit our website at globalliver.org and follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram using the hashtag NASH Day. A special thank you to ASLD, the American Association for the Study of Liver Diseases, and to EASL, the home of hepatology, the European Association for the Study of the Liver for endorsing IND and being such great partners with us. I also wanna take a moment to thank our corporate sponsors for whom we, we couldn't do this without your, your support. Um, I also want to, to call out a, a new sponsor who isn't on this slide, um, Anata uh, Pharmaceuticals, who allowed us to uh, have the IND logo um, at NASDAQ. So we are, you know, uh, our message is going out over Times Square um, as we speak. So thank you to, to all of those uh, corporations who have supported us. And so now I'd like to introduce um, our August panel for the topic of NASH and liver cancer. Very excited about the experts that we have with you today. Um, Dr. Scott Friedman uh, is a former ASLD president uh, and a future everything else. Uh, his titles go on. Uh, we wouldn't have time uh, for the course of this conversation, but amongst many, he is the Dean of Therapeutic Discovery and the Fishberg Professor of Medicine at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. We have Jacqueline Daly, who's a board member of the European Cancer Patient Coalition. Noel Lacanti, who is an associate professor of medicine at the University of Wisconsin and representing one of our new partners, um, ASCO. Uh, not new, of course, to cancer and to liver cancer, the American Society of Clinical Oncology. We're so excited to have ASCO with us today. Um, Dr. Vlad Drazio from France, um, who's a professor of hepatology at the Sorbonne and a co-editor of the Journal of Hepatology, and Maria Rich, who is a hepatologist in the liver unit um, in Barcelona and also an easel scientific committee member. So welcome to you all. Thank you for being here. Um, I'll take a moderator's prerogative for a, a moment and simply say that um, for the Global Liver Institute, of which I, which I am uh, honored to be the founder and CEO, uh, NASH and liver cancer are our two uh, strategic pillars. Um, using the model of convening councils, bringing people together, um, and across both our NASH and liver cancers council, we have more than 100 members, more than 100 different academic institutions, um, medical societies, nursing societies, patient advocacy organizations, um, to better create a unified action agenda in both NASH and liver cancer, and also to be able to discuss the, the intersections between the two, which is our, our topic today. Um, this is one of the many opportunities that, that creates uh, a place for discussion uh, for NASH as a driver of liver cancer. And few people are aware of um, the rise of obesogenic cancers. And we have an incredible group assembled here um, to discuss these two interconnected issues. And it's my great pleasure to turn over this panel and to, to step back a bit uh, to Dr. Scott Friedman to give us an overview of NASH-driven liver cancer and ensure that this conversation reaches its full potential. So Dr. Friedman, to you. Great to be here. I have to apologize because for some reason my camera freezes very regularly. So I'll try to, uh, but you'll hear me no matter what. I'll try to stay on top of it, but uh, bear with me if you see a frozen image with a moving voice. Okay. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I'm especially delighted to share the uh, podium or platform with uh, the other uh, speakers who are all experts in a range of areas. And I thought what I'd do is 
uh, take a couple of minutes to outline what I think are some of the really pressing unmet needs and questions. And this will really establish a framework for us to uh, get into a more interactive uh, conversation. So uh, let me just start by uh, emphasizing the general challenge of liver cancer or hepatocellular carcinoma. It's the fastest rising cancer uh, in terms of its relative incidence year on year uh, in the Western world, certainly in Europe and the US. Uh, and among the causes, uh, viruses still remain the primary or most dominant cause, but NASH, uh, owing to its relative increase in prevalence, is rapidly increasing. And in fact, the paper that just came out a couple of days ago from Zobar Yanassi and his colleagues underscored the fact that uh, as a disease, NASH is now the fastest rising indication for liver transplantation. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're beginning to see that, uh, uh, not surprisingly, hepatocellular carcinoma attributable to NASH is increasing as well. We also have to remember that patients with viral liver disease are also at risk for NASH as well as liver disease from alcohol. So the convergence of more than one etiology can be especially uh, hazardous in the precipitation of liver cancer. Uh, so there are really a number of questions that occur. The first is, um, uh, why does this occur at all? What are the molecular drivers of hepatocellular carcinoma NASH? Are they unique to this etiology or are they more similar to viral hepatitis that leads to cancer? Um, one of the very unique features of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma associated with NASH is a higher propensity to arise before patients are cirrhotic. So for hepatitis B and C, 5 to 15% of the cancers that arise are in patients who have F3 fibrosis rather than F4 cirrhosis. In NASH, that number is somewhere between 30 and 50%, meaning a sizable fraction of the cancers that arise in patients with NASH occur before patients are recognized to have advanced liver disease. And as a result, when those cancers are diagnosed, on average, NASH cancers tend to be larger and because they're larger, they're less amenable to curative therapy. So one question that is, uh, that is very compelling is, given the, the difference in the fraction of non serotic patients in NASH, when should we start screening? Uh, and uh, screening guidelines haven't really caught up to this yet, so we need to really evaluate that uh, very thoughtfully, and I think Vlad can speak to that based on his vast clinical experience. Uh, the next challenge is, um, what are the optimal treatments and are there unique molecular drivers of the disease of cancer associated with NASH that would lead to unique therapies or therapeutic targets and new therapies that should be directed at the cancers arising in NASH patients. Um, and we're in the threshold of a new era for medical therapy of cancer in general. Will those new therapies, particularly at, at, at tezolizumab and bevacizumab, which were just approved, do they have equal efficacy in NASH cancers as they do in other cancers? Um, then I think a critical issue, uh, which uh, Dr. Lacante can address, is how do we minimize the risk? How do we prevent this cancer? And will treatments that attenuate the drivers of the metabolic syndrome, uh, for example, insulin resistance and um, diabetes, if we attenuate those factors, Will that translate into decreased development of liver disease and liver cancer? And I know we don't have all the answers yet, but that for me is a very compelling one, a very compelling question. And then finally, and equally importantly from Jacqueline Daly, what are the, what are the, uh, uh, in, or what is the impact on patients? Uh, do they, are they aware of this? Uh, are they concerned about it? Uh, does their behavior towards screening uh, and concern about disease equal or is it comparable to other etiologies of chronic liver disease? Or are there unique challenges for the NASH patient uh, that we should be aware of because it may influence our management and our recommendations with respect to prevention? So a lot to digest, uh, but we've got the right people on the, on the webinar. And so maybe uh, that's a good place to hand it back to Donna and ask if uh, you'd like to approach any of the speakers about some of these issues. Absolutely. Well, I'd love to start with the patient impact. Um, and so, Jacqueline, would you like to tell us about the, the work that you're doing and, and the impact of, of liver cancer um, across different patient communities? Uh, thank you. Um, well, uh, ECPC, the European Cancer Patient Coalition, we are working 
uh, very hard to make sure that cancer patients' voices are heard. And we have um, our, our logo, our, our motto is nothing about us without us. So we feel very strongly that we should be involved, um, you know, right along the way. So in Europe, but they un, well, right across the world, the un, un, um, unprecedented coronavirus pandemic has shaken not only the European and global healthcare systems, but also European and global societies that have been hit hard by disease, burden and death toll. During this pandemic, cancer patients across Europe have experienced severe disruptions in medicine shortages, health system response problems and unequal access to healthcare. However, a global pandemic cannot stop our efforts for patients impacted by cancer. Liver disease in Europe is a serious issue with increasing psoriasis and liver cancer. The World Health Organization estimates that liver cancer is responsible for around 47,000 deaths per year in the EU. Um, it's the fifth most, um, liver cancer is the, is the fifth most common cause um, in Europe. Um, sorry, I've just lost my place there. I'm going to come back again. That's fine. And that's fine. The cellular carcinoma consisting of 90 or 70 to 90 percent of cases of primary liver cancer is the fifth most common cause of cancer in Europe and one of the most serious outcome of cirrhosis with a five year relative survival rate of 18.4 percent. It is of concern. Can, that I, can I stop you a moment there, Jacqueline? I just yeah. want that to sink in, that liver cancer has a less than 20% survival rate. Yes. But this is why we're having this conversation. This is why it's so important to shine the spotlight um, on liver cancer. You know, there's so much, um, you know, great news that's, that's talked about, oh, we're, you know, we're, we're defeating cancer but we don't remember and think about liver cancer whose rates are, are, are below 20%, 18%. I just wanted to stop for a moment so we, we didn't sort of skirt over that really shocking, startling fact there. And so let me let, me let you continue, but I just wanted people to make sure we, we heard that, if nothing else. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Can I add something? This is a, a very important information. So in aggregate, of course, the, the prognosis is, is small, is really bad, as you mm -hmm. said. But what's really striking is that at the same time, people who are diagnosed early, and I think Maria can speak to that, with small tumors, uh, they mm -hmm. have very high chances of, of having a, a curative therapy, at least at, at five or 10 years. And we all have patients that have had an early form of liver cancer that has been rejected or destroyed by radiofrequency or other methods, local regional therapies, and are alive 10 years after. So uh, that's, I think that's one of the major challenges in the future is early detection. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Maria, I, I do you want to speak to that? Yeah, yeah I, I fully agree with your comment. And indeed, the aim of uh, us is to improve the overall survival of patients and a screening program, early detection of the liver cancer is the key thing for, for us. For, that's why this is one of the key areas of research that we have, because patients with nafali are non cirrhotics but however, they have some nodules that are very difficult to identify and define if they are really nodules of potential risk factor of liver cancer or not. So uh, we need to focus in the, in, point that we are able to identify the, uh, the tumor very, very early and try to induce to have a curative treatment for them. Maybe we can discuss later on all of the screening issues and so on. Absolutely. But I, I just wanted to, to mention something because it's been, uh, you know, said, said twice now that uh, a patient can become, uh, can have cancer without having had cirrhosis. And so, so often it's uh, you know, depicted to patients as this sort of you know, linear progression, um, uh, you know, step by step that you have to have this before that. And so I, I just want to make sure that we've explained to people that um, sometimes it doesn't exactly work out that way. Um, yeah. And that yeah. people can, can develop uh, cancer without having gone, gone through those steps. And so you know, we do need to make sure that we're, we're catching this as, as early as possible. 
Yeah, that, that's why this is one of the areas that we need to work more than we have until now, because there are a lot of competitive risks. Some risks are high risk of developing cancer, but others as coffee is a, another a factor that could be associated with less risk of right. cancer. And it's also important to mention that it's not only HEC, we're talking about liver cancer and it could be also cholangiocarcinoma. Yeah. So there are many things to, to discuss here. So, yeah, so Scott, I, is, it, is it correct that every patient with a pre-existing liver disease, viral hepatitis, NASH, should be screened for liver cancer every six months? And is that happening? If you want to answer for patient with cirrhosis, yeah. the, the, the answer is yes. For patient without cirrhosis, depending on the etiology, the recommendation is different. In the specific case of a NAFLD patient, this is an area of discussion. We did a, a meta-analyze in this area, and the risk is depend of the population that you study. And the data that we have now is very heterogeneous. So this is for sure an area for working. Scott? Yeah, I, I think prevention goes even one step further, or I shouldn't say uh, prevention. Screening goes one step uh, after prevention. And one of the hopes of work uh, in our lab and many others is to understand what are the molecular events that are predisposing to the cancer in the first place. Mm -hmm. So the obvious uh, good example is we know now that if we cure hepatitis C with the wonderful drugs that are available, mm -hmm. or if we uh, suppress hepatitis B viral replication, that has a significant uh, improvement or leads to a significant improvement in the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, what we'd also like to know is uh, for those patients who have a cancer prone liver, are there chemo preventive strategies mm -hmm. that are attacking very specific pathways? And that for me is a major unmet need in the field and particularly mm -hmm. at NASH where we think there are a lot of metabolic events that are driving cancers. And if we knew what they were and we could identify them, we might be able to use primary chemo prevention to prevent that first cancer from ever occurring. But that's still a pipe dream. We're not there in terms of chemo prevention yet. Hmm. Noelle, I want to bring you into the conversation. Let's make sure we've unmuted you. Let me see if I still have the master. There we go. Unmuted. Fantastic. So, Noelle, um, from either your work at your university or from an ASCO perspective, um, prevention screening, how can we get patients diagnosed earlier so they can take advantage of all the wonderful innovation that's being created in HCC, in, in liver cancer? Yeah, and before I will answer that, but I just wanted to mention too, a major complicating factor is that in the United States where we largely use the big tumor registry called SEER, um, they lump cholangiocarcinoma and hepatocellular carcinoma together, which makes studying patterns and trends very, very difficult. So I think from an advocacy perspective, mm -hmm. it would be great for us to have a unified voice to say, we want those separate. And ideally, intrahepatic clangio separate from extrahepatic, but that's a, you know, mm -hmm. that's a big dream. I'm noting so, it. Um, this is, yeah. big dreams are my, that's my bailiwick. That's, where, <laughs> yeah, that's my jam, that's where I live. Yeah, we need the data to know if we're making a difference. Um, I think the focus of ASCO has been two. One has been around awareness for alcohol and cancer mm -hmm. and needed areas of further research. I think a key area is the effect of continuing to drink on cancer treatments. Mm -hmm. um, but also, um, we think that stopping or reducing drinking reduces your risk, but we don't really know that. You would think we would know that very clearly, but it's still not 100% certain. And we know that doctors are not aware of the association and they're not really talking to their patients. So in ASCO, we've really been trying to do education, and that was a statement that we put out a couple mm -hmm. years ago. And then more recently, we've put out some statements around universal hep C testing mm -hmm. as a means to reduce liver cancer, and that includes NASH patients. And then within the last year, the United States Preventive Service Task Force has now made a universal recommendation that every adult should be tested at least once for hep C, screened for hep C. We think that by treating hep C, we will reduce liver cancer, including in patients with NASH. And then uh, I would be remiss not to mention access to treatment in that conversation, mm -hmm. because although treatments for hepatitis C are very, very effective, they are also very expensive. And not everybody has the ability to access those treatments with the same availability or um, equal access. 
Noel, thank you. And I, I have uh, had the privilege of serving on an ANASCO guidelines committee around uh, hepatitis B and, and uh, um, induction of chemotherapy and prior to, and uh, so I want to thank you for, you know, including patients in your process um, yeah. and for the work that you mentioned in doing. I'm, as an advocate, I'm going to push you to work more on, uh, with us on NASH and liver cancer and, and, and look forward to having, you know, started that um, today because ASCO is really such an important platform. You know, the Global Liver Institute um, in our Liver Cancers Council, we've worked with the ACCC on some work. We work with NCCN on providing the first patient versions of the liver cancer guidelines and, and love to expand our work with, with ASCO across on, on NASH and, 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 and liver cancer. Um, so, okay. uh, you know, and, and what the Liver Cancer Council really has come down as we convened, including our friends at the Calandria Carcinoma Foundation, was, was this, this highlight on, on screening and on policy. And so I want to bring Jacqueline back into the conversation on what does, what does cancer screening look like in, in Europe? I know it has to be a variety of things across different countries, but in terms of you know, your platform and information and, and how you can uh, you know, make it more accessible um, to, to patients, whether they come in through a GI or hepatologist or radiology, you know, there are different pathways to, to get uh, screened for liver cancer, but, but how do you approach it uh, in, from, from your organization? Well, at the moment, we are actually working closely with the European Commission and there has been um, a lot of funding is going to be made available um, in the coming years, which is, which is exactly what we want to hear. Um, but what, what we actually feel is that it's important to fund more data collection programs in order to understand the magnitude of liver disease prevalence mm -hmm. and, and how and why it has changed over time what's going to work to reduce the population's uh, risk. Um, and we're looking at best practices of sharing among countries is also crucial so that we can actually share information. Mm -hmm. um, and we need the EU policies to focus more on addressing dis the disparities among member states regarding access to testing mm -hmm. and diagnosis, um, especially with viral hepatitis. Thank you. Those are so critically important issues. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, one of the challenges, uh, which I'll just put out there, that uh, there's no easy answer to, is the stigmatization of liver disease, mm -hmm. um, and, which extends to liver cancer. And um, I don't have an easy solution, but uh, it, it, is, uh, it is true that some of the patients with liver disease uh, have, uh, have uh, developed a liver cancer because, or associated with alcohol abuse, mm -hmm. uh, with needle use. Nonetheless, the majority of patients with liver disease, first of all, everybody deserves good care. And beyond that, you know, the, the majority of patients with liver disease uh, did nothing wrong, or not that anyone, uh, you know, any of those behaviors is wrong, but, you know, basically uh, we need to somehow overcome the, the, stigma, the stigmatization of liver disease and the risk of liver cancer uh, in order to uh, improve access and also address disparities because a lot of these, risk factors are more prevalent in specific populations uh, that are often uh, overlooked or have reduced access to care. I, 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 I welcome any ideas about how we begin to address that. Um, I think we can take a, a page from the lung cancer experience where there was early on the split between did you have a smoking related lung cancer or a non-smoking related lung cancer and how I think the intent there was to say, look, you can still get lung cancer even if you didn't smoke. But what ended up happening was it just siloed people further. And so I would, I would caution us away from people that have lifestyle related liver cancer versus not. I think what you said is exactly spot on. No one deserves cancer. No one is perfect. Nobody made 100% perfect choices in their life. You know, it could be any of us really. So trying to normalize it. But I agree with you, the lack of advocates really holds it back because the way we fund a lot of cancer research is driven by advocacy. So we so let, yeah, uh, on the stigma, you know, issue, um, as most of you know, uh, you know, I drive a hepatic burgundy car with liver lady license plates. And uh, I mean, part of that is just stigma reduction and to, you know, to show people that liver disease can look like this. Um, and I've had people, you know, knock on the door uh, of our house and say, does that 
say what it means to, you know, what I think it means. And, uh, and they'll come and just tell me stories. They're like, you know, um, I, I think I might have liver disease or somebody has told me I had, you know, can you help connect me to a, you know, to a doctor? So I, I, I think you're right, you know, um, and we have our Advanced Advocacy Academy to, you know, seed the ecosystem with more people who are willing to talk about their experience having uh, liver diseases of a variety of types um, and, and telling people that it looks like, it looks like me, it looks like your mom, it looks like your dad, it looks like your neighbor. Um, you know, I, I say, you know, if you have a liver, you are, which is everybody, it takes some, some people take some moment about that. If you have a liver, um, that you are at risk um, of, of a liver disease. And so um, I think putting it in that, in that context, and I think that's why talking about liver health rather than liver diseases is always, I think, a good positioning. We've talked about, uh, even the course of this day, um, children uh, who have NASH, who have liver diseases. Um, and so really opening people's minds to liver health as a public health challenge um, and something that uh, does affect them personally, you know, no matter their circumstances, is sort of some of the ways that, that we um, try to address, uh, you know, stigma. And in NASH, there's sort of the double stigma often of, of overweight um, and, uh, and liver disease or and so, um, you know, thank you for the lessons from other uh, cancer advocates. We take lessons from our HIV colleagues and our obesity colleagues on stigma reduction. It's, it's something, you know, really important. And Maria, you wanted to say something about this? Yes, uh, in the same direction, as you mentioned before, the other factor that could help us in the future is now we have better treatment for HEC. Yeah. So the patient have good stories to explain. In the right. past, HEC or liver cancer was associated with very bad outcome and the patients are not uh, enough uh, in that way to, to tell the history. So for me, it's both try to improve the stigmatization of liver disease and also good options that we have now for liver cancer that could help us to, to communicate better what is the disease and how do you evolve. So Vlad, you've been quiet there for a moment because you're, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry, yes. So no. just, to, just to add to this, um, to this, this idea about stigma, particularly applying to NASH. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, from how I understand it, I, I'm not a specialist in psychology or stigma, but from what I understand, it can occur at two levels. First mm -hmm. level is you have been exposed to risk factors. You shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have smoked, smoked, smoked. You shouldn't have eaten so much. You've done more exercise. You have been exposed to these factors. You shouldn't have. Your lifestyle was not healthy and so on. That's first level of stigma. The second level of stigma is okay, this happened to you, but mm -hmm. we all know that, and I'm taking Nash an example, sure. things can be reversible to a large degree mm -hmm. if from now on you start implementing a healthy lifestyle, healthy dietary habits, and mm -hmm. so on. So why don't you do that? And, and that's a second level of stigma that I think patients accept even less because some of them know very well that there are, there are things in the natural history of the disease, they make it, and in the way the, the organism adapts to, a, to mm -hmm. a certain metabolic state, they make it impossible for them to fight against that. Right. So, and one excellent example is diabetes. I, I, don't, I don't know how things were 50 or 60 years ago, but I, today nobody blames diabetic patients and tell them they just should just start exercising and losing weight and then their diabetes will go away. They treat them with drugs because they know mm -hmm. that past a certain point, the organist can no longer fight. We know that people who lose massive weight after mm -hmm. obesity, uh, obesity surgery, bariatric surgery, have a very, very strong hormonal-based, very well-explained drive to eat more so that the, the organism can restore right. its initial weight. And it's very hard to fight against that because there are neural, neural hormonal mediators mm -hmm. that, that force your society to, to, go, to drive you to eat to go back normal. So I think that what's really striking, and you all saw that, a lot of NASH patients tell you they don't eat that much. Mm -hmm. A lot of them have a very healthy type of eating, but some others are beyond that point. They, they no longer can lose weight, even if they try very hard to do so. And I think we need to study this a bit more, but I think there, it's a matter of how the, the, the organism reprograms it, its metabolism at a higher mm -hmm. level. And they, 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 they waste less calories, and they're not able to, to keep up with even a small amount of in intake. So the stigma here should be sort of dissipated or 
fought against by explaining people two things. First, that those the, these are mechanisms against which the organism alone can, and the, the, the will of the patient mm -hmm. alone can no longer fight. And second, the, the tremendous uh, injustice, in, which is in medical terms called heterogeneity of exposure mm -hmm. to risk factors, because even if you can, be, you can drink alcohol and not have cirrhosis, you can smoke mm -hmm. uh, and not have liver cancer, and you can eat a lot and have uh, this sort of healthy metabolic obesity. Mm -hmm. So we're all very heterogeneous in terms of how we deal with these risk factors, and that's not something that a person can control through his will. Uh, Vlad, that's a, those are some really excellent points. You know, it occurs to me that in in Nash, you know, we're asking people uh, to lose seven to ten percent of their weight to really start to make a difference in terms of regression. That's a lot of weight, um, and to sustain it over time, just at the point where, as you point out, their body may be fighting back, maybe having insulin resistance, maybe. Uh, they have fatigue as a syndrome, they have sarcopenia, they have muscle wasting, so they're less capable of moving their body. So um, we're asking them to do more when they have maybe less resources in which to do that. And we haven't really explained that issue even to the patients themselves, but also in many cases to the physicians outside of hepatology so that we can be supporting them appropriately and, and, and setting them up for, for success. Um, Certainly, I think there are a lot of things that we can learn from the cancer community in terms of how we support the whole person um, as they're navigating uh, cancer, um, whether it's in their, their wellness and their yoga and their mindset and their, their physicality and their responses to treatments. Um, and so um, I, I'll just say this before I pass along. I, you know, I'm 25 years post liver transplant. I, I remember looking over at the cancer wards and being like jealous of cancer patients because they were, you know, treated so well. They had fish tanks and pretty colors, and people did their makeup. You know, they just there was a tension, um, and there was a, a thoughtfulness about them um, as people that I, I certainly want to bring to liver patients. Someone. Uh, remarked the other day that we're not just livers with legs, um, that, uh, you know, that sort of whole person care and that, that whole life consideration is something that I think would be really is important to our NASH and liver cancer advocacy uh, and important to our, our success and impact on, on with patients. That's really a very powerful uh, story, Donna. I, I appreciate you sharing it. Um, it it's, uh, we, you know, we have a long way to go in terms of uh, um, providing holistic care around liver disease. And uh, the clearly academic centers that have uh, larger patient volumes mm -hmm. are probably more attuned to this. But I think the bulk of patients with liver disease, certainly in the United States, are not cared for by hepatologists by any right. means. They're cared for by gastroenterologists or even internists. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I think you know education in that setting is gonna be really important. So we have some questions from Facebook um, that I want to, this is interactive, so I, I want to pose this to the group. Um, one of the questions is, does uh, AFP or alpha fetal protein uh, uh, blood test work for um, liver cancer screening? Maybe six months. It's a good question and it is the controversy for years. Uh, up to now, it is uh, some interpretation of that. For example, the ASLD guidelines recommend AFP in some scenarios. The ESL guideline doesn't recommend that. But the, the most important thing for patients is there are some tumors that do not have AFP. So maybe if you use only AFP, you can lose to identify more of the, more of the patient. Mm -hmm. There are some score that could also consider FP, but it's a controversial area that, mm -hmm. at least from our point of view, we need to continue working on that. And maybe the biomarkers, AFP mm -hmm. or others, could be the future for us. Um, we know that's an evolving area because, uh, as we were saying sort of before this call, we were all, uh, you know, pulling off our printers, uh, the, the paper from, from Cell. Um, about the NCI and NIDDK uh, and their advances in testing. So it's certainly a, a hot area of research. And as you know, GLI has an entire campaign called Beyond the Biopsy. Um, and so, you know, we're very much in terms of uh, 
facilitating the development and, uh, and validation, you don't gonna wanna get ahead of the evidence, but the validation of uh, non-invasive testing. I, I certainly say that as a patient who's had six liver biopsies, so I think I have some standing on the issue. So liquid biopsies in cancer and, and the types of things, uh, an AFP mm -hmm. test, which was easy enough to take. Uh, it was interesting that my uh, hemonc was the one who wanted to do it. My, you know, transplant team and my, you know, GI team were, you know, not as not as interested. So, um, this, uh, the, you know, diversion uh, of, of of how specialists think about this and and approach this in treating their patients is something that uh, you know patients need to be sensitive sensitive to as we think about unifying messages across uh, across specialties and across the medical societies. So what, uh, what should we be doing? A critical point uh, that was implied by Maria's comments is that AFP alone is not sufficient. Right. And that uh, there have in, you know, I think most practices, there has to be uh, standard imaging. Now, which modality is preferred depends in part on where you are in the world and the quality of the ultrasound, for example. I know in Europe, physicians typically do ultrasounds. They do a more comprehensive evaluation, whereas in the US ultrasounds are done by technicians and so the, the quality can be more uneven and the test cannot be as comprehensive. So uh, yeah, I'm not advocating for a specific kind of imaging, mm -hmm. but I am advocating that some imaging be used to complement AFP. Mm -hmm. AFP alone is not sufficient. That is really helpful. You know, one of the things that um, as we've been trying to, um, as we talk about research and, and having a good, uh, you know, foundation and, and data. One of the things that we've been trying to understand um, is who has what type of technology. Um, so what imaging are they using or what type of non-invasive testing are they using either for NASH or, or liver cancer so we can make recommendations and, and you know, I'd rather have um, people use what they have than, um, you know, be overly prescriptive, it seems, in uh, you know, in saying one one technology over over the other, I think we have such a long way to go in terms of identifying patients and linking them to care in whatever fashion people have, um, you know, at their disposal. That I think that that seems to me to be the the you know the better message at this at this time. I see a lot of nodding heads. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what, uh, you know, we've seen, uh, we have a virtual Hill Day going on. Um, we have, uh, you know, policy positions moving. Some of that is about um, having the CDC, uh, you know, better able to uh, uh, provide us the data so we understand the scope of the problem and to the point of being able to differentiate between um, uh, bile duct cancers and liver cancers, having, having that data and understanding so that we can design a, you know, policy and reimbursement solutions that, you know, that match. So if we are designing a, uh, you know, a liver cancer system and, and liver cancer policies um, for, the, for the future, what, what should it look like? What should it, what should it have? Um, Vlad, you're, you're, you're now head of all European liver policy. What should we uh, what should we put in place? Or Scott will make you head of liver policy. Good question. I, I think <laughs> that. Well, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Go ahead. Go ahead. So, no, I I don't know what how to answer. Nonetheless, I think that as as uh, Scott said in the beginning, one of the the problems with Nash is that at least some patients can have liver cancer without cirrhosis. And clearly those patients exist, but there are not very many of them. And the incidence uh, of, of cancer on non-cirrhotic liver is too low to justify systematic screening. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's one problem. Uh, the, the second problem is that uh, even in cirrhotic NASH, the, the, the chances of, having, of developing liver cancer can be very different from one patient to another, depending on, on some characteristics. And there are already several studies that have tried to identify the heterogeneity of risk for cancer within the cirrhotic population. And it can go from 0.5% to three or 4% per year, mm -hmm. uh, depending on, on how many risk factors the patient accumulates, mm -hmm. independent of cirrhosis. So I think one of the first things to do is to better understand who is at risk, mm -hmm. because clearly it will not be cost effective to screen every NASH patient, 
it would, and it might not even be cost effective to screen every cirrhotic NASH patient uh, because some of them have very low risk. So better understanding uh, who are the patients on whom we should concentrate our screening efforts is already one thing. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing, of course, is availability. Uh, I, I, I know that there are parts of the world where, where uh, things that as, as simple as ultrasound are not available for screening. And I think there have been many studies performed in the United States that have shown that despite of the recommendations and top of the art, uh, state of the art technology, of course, in, in, in hospitals and, and, and uh, healthcare facilities, a lot of people do not have even an ultrasound every six months, even though they have cirrhosis. So th there is an issue here, and it, it's a complex issue that I cannot comment on, but it's not only availability, it's also cost, is whether some health providers are willing to do this type of exam and how much it costs and what are what's the benefit for the healthcare provider for doing that. So those are very complicated issues, but I think implementing, a, strongly implementing a policy of monitoring, once we have identified a little better, the risk factors can be a good place to start. Yeah, from a scientific perspective, mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, you know, there's a fair bit of data, some of from our group and uh, from a former faculty who was here at Mount Sinai, mm -hmm. Eugene Moshida, that suggests that specific gene expression profiles within the cirrhotic tissue mm -hmm. can be highly predictive of whether a cancer is likely to emerge down the road. The challenge, of course, is we're not doing routine biopsies to capture that information. Mm -hmm. And so the real, um, I would say the, 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 the real need would be for a liquid biopsy type test mm -hmm. that captures that genetic information that started within the cirrhotic liver and tells us, yes, this is a patient who needs screening every six months. Mm -hmm. Another patient may not, be screen, may not need screening based on their genetic risk within the makeup of their liver tissue. So that's something on the horizon that we hope will translate into novel third diagnostics. Yeah, I fully agree with that, and I believe that maybe we need to work in a multi-center, a multidisciplinary project mm -hmm. that we start working with the radiology from the beginning, but also for the basic science and also very different clinical disciplines, regardless of the specialty, to, to find the, the solution, because if not, if we only visit the patient with cirrhosis, we are late. Mm -hmm. If, if I can add something also, yes. I think it's, it's a, a, another level of complexity is that NASH arises in people who are overweight and diabetic mostly, okay? Mm -hmm. Independent of NASH, obesity by itself is associated with a higher risk of multiple sites of cancer. Right. Diabetes is associated with many types of cancer, in particular liver cancer. The risk increases at least by a factor of 2.5 or 3 uh, versus a non-diabetic person. So the larger question beyond NASH itself is the message that people who share the comorbidities that can lead to NASH are also at increased risk of liver cancer. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the, here again, it might not be cost effective to screen all of them unless we can understand better who is at risk. But what we need to think about is whether the concept of NASH Mm -hmm. at least can help us driving attention, uh, drawing attention, sorry, to the diabetic or obese population so that through the identification and the diagnosis of the liver disease, we bring them maybe a step closer uh, to screening them for liver cancer, or at least to, to assess their risk of liver cancer. So see, it's complicated because mm -hmm. it doesn't serve much purpose, guys. It doesn't serve much purpose to talk about uh, how do we screen NASH patients for liver cancer if most of the NASH patients are hidden in the large number of obese or diabetic people mm -hmm. uh, without even the diagnosis of NASH that, are, that is made. And, and despite that, they're at risk of liver cancer. So let me ask this, this question from, from this direction. In, um, in cancer trials, are we doing enough to make sure that we're capturing um, NASH patients in those cancer trials? Um, uh, in this, you know, in larger bodies of research, are we missing out perhaps on um, NASH-driven cancer because we're not even asking the question, there isn't a field for that? Um, is that is that part of the problem? Or what are other, some other things as we sort of make this last uh, round before we close that how we can improve cancer research so that 
NASH and cancer research um, takes a leap forward? Uh, I mean, my thoughts on that, having done cancer uh, drug development, is that um, oftentimes it's not an intentional exclusion, but that right. the liver function test eligibilities are so tight that NASH mm -hmm. patients often cannot get on or um, rapidly fall off the study because, you know, their transaminases go up a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I so I think we need to be a little bit more inclusive in who we let on these studies, a little more permissive, but that's a, speaking as a clinician and not as a, you know, person whose ability to keep their company open is dependent on this drug getting approved. So I think the National Institute of Health mm -hmm. taking a lead on a lot of these drugs would be helpful. Mm -hmm. We would remove the financial incentive, which I think drives a lot of this decision making sometimes. And then I would be a strong advocate for patient reported outcomes or PROs being yes. added into these trials rather than just how often do we make their x-ray look better or how often, you know, do we help their lack of progression last longer. I really care about does the patient feel better? Is their quality of life better? And then is their survival better? Those are the two things that matter the most and you don't see a lot of PROs in liver cancer studies necessarily. Okay. Can I make a comment? Please. Yeah, in clinical trials in liver cancer, for me, the problem for NASH patient is the comorbidities. Mm -hmm. Many of the exclusion criteria related to cardiovascular disease or complications related to diabetes or all of these things. Mm -hmm. So at the end, they are excluded for the trials because they are high risk of developing complications. So maybe in the future, we can think them as a special population mm -hmm. instead of consider that they're excluded for the trial for other reasons. I love it. These are giving me excellent talking points for my conversations with FDA and, and NCI and NIDDK. So uh, Scott, I'm going to give you the last word before I, before I close. Sure. Well, first of all, I want to underscore something Vlad said that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we are uh, not cognizant of all the patients uh, in our communities who have NASH that they don't know it and their providers don't know it. And I'll give you a very cogent example. We approached our diabetologist and we said we'd like to start doing fiber scan which as most of you mm -hmm. know uh, a bedside uh, stiffness test uh, to indicate whether patients who have diabetes might have uh, increased liver stiffness consistent with early NASH or NASH and the diabetologist said our patients don't have liver disease and we said okay but let us try and not surprisingly 70 percent of diabetics in our practice had abnormal liver stiffness um, so even the endocrinologists who are focused on the hemoglobin A1C and diabetes management mm -hmm. weren't really sensitized to the fact that their patients had liver disease. So I think, um, you know, that leads me to a broader uh, kind of summary, which is, uh, as we discussed this and went around, it became increasingly clear to me, we have more challenges uh, than answers, and we have <laughs> probably more challenges than uh, for other chronic liver diseases that predispose to cancer because we mm -hmm. have comorbidities, we have a lack of detection, we have a lack of knowledge about the um, uh, genetic makeup of these cancers as to whether they're the same or different. Uh, we don't know when to screen. Um, and then last but most importantly, we don't have good inputs from patients about both awareness uh, uh, and, and uh, patient reported outcomes what are the comorbidities and, uh, you know, from the lens of, through the lens of the patient, what does this look like? What are they worried about? And uh, how can we address their unmet needs in terms of living longer and healthier lives? So um, this panel is so important for highlighting um, these and other issues, but I think we're really just at the beginning of a longer conversation that I think ultimately over years, but not months, will translate into improvements in diagnosis and therapy. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that job security for the <laughs> the next uh, decade or so. Clearly, clearly, my work is not is not done. Um, but thank you today for yes for highlighting and and helping us spotlight uh, shine a spotlight on this issue of Nash and liver cancer. Thank you to all of you. Um, who have been part of this conversation, uh, both the speakers and to our, our audience. Thank you for your questions and your feedback. Um, for more information, you see this, uh, how you can uh, keep up with this conversation on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Um, these, uh, all of our panels today um, have been recorded, will be uh, shared on YouTube uh, and on the GLI website. And um, 
we also want to encourage you to go to the website at globalliver.org to see the interactive map um, of what all of our partners around the world are doing um, to acknowledge uh, International NASH Day and to improve the lives of, of, of patients. Um, and I think in, through that, in, in to improve a few lives of some physicians and researchers as, as well. Um, so I just wish everybody uh, stay safe, be well, and, and share what you've learned here today. Thank you so much. And Thank you for your leadership, Donna. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.